Good morning and welcome to South Albemarle. We're in the book of Luke today. We've been going cruising along in this. We have this lesson and one more. And there's, uh, we're at that place where Jesus has been resurrected from the dead. And in chapter 24 of where we are today, the ladies have gone down to the tomb and they have found that the body is gone. We looked at that earlier and we come to this passage of scripture on the Emmaus Road and Jesus makes an appearance there. You know, there's a lot of talk today about identity and about uh, identification. As a matter of fact, there's a, well, so much in the news. Do you need identification to vote? Do you need identification to get on a plane? And it uh, seems like a lot of discrepancy. Some places that you think you would really need it, you don't. And some where you don't think you need it, you have to show it, don't you? And the question comes as we think about identification. You know, you can look at your picture, but if I show you my picture, I don't that think that that really identifies who I am. I, I think we're more than what that picture is. And what I mean by that, uh, if you're young and you're beautiful and you look at that picture, it's one thing, but as you get older and you look at it and say, oh my goodness, that's not me. Uh, we, we, we are the same person. As a matter of fact, we may have grown more mature. We may have grown a little sweeter on the inside, but it's not portrayed on the outside. Well, as we look at this uh, lesson today, we're going to look at Jesus' appearance to a couple of disciples, not the 11 disciples, but the others. Let's pick up, if you will, in verse 18. And one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered and said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and hast not known the things which are come to pass in these days? And he said unto him, What things? And they said unto him concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet mighty indeed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priest and our rulers delivered unto him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And besides all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Earlier in this chapter, you're given the story that uh, just a couple of verses back that these two men are walking to on the Emmaus Road, this community. It's about seven miles from Jerusalem. And as they're walking, they're having this discussion. And Jesus appears and begins to walk beside of them. Uh, they, and they begin to talk. And they seem discouraged. And they seem very sad about what was going on. And Jesus inquired of them a little bit about what things you saw that and G Jesus is going to go through a process with these two disciples I think this process will help us as we look I want you to notice a couple of things about this first of all they ask Jesus are you a stranger here in Jerusalem because everybody knows what happened on Friday everybody here knows about that crucifixion and we know that they took Jesus and they crucified him. Now, these two disciples, they're understanding, and Jesus appears to them, and they don't recognize him. Now, a lot of questions, and I have a lot of questions, why they don't recognize who Jesus is. And as they carry on this conversation, I'll just tell you in the beginning, it's a, it's a long ways into this conversation before they understand who Jesus really is. And so there are a couple of things that we see and we begin to see what they thought about Jesus and what they thought Jesus' role was. Well, I read you a few things, and let me get, just go back and touch on them. First of all, in the middle of that passage in the quarterly, they called Jesus of Nazareth. Why did they call him that? Well, we mentioned several weeks ago when somebody would, uh, in that day, Many might have the same first name, and they identified him by the place that they lived. Jesus, he was from Nazareth. That's what they called him. They didn't call him Jesus the Christ. They didn't call him Jesus Christ. They didn't call him the Messiah. So you begin to see their understanding of who Jesus was is not quite what it needs to be. There's another thing about it. They said here, he is a prophet, mighty indeed, and word before God and all the people. Well, they understood that he was 
different than everybody else. They believed he was different than the prophets of the Old Testament, but they had not come to the understanding that he was the Messiah. He was the one that was sent. Notice something else. They, he, they say he was from God, and they didn't understand that he was God. He was God himself that they were talking to. And that we begin to see they're confused about this. They're confused about Jesus' mission and what he came to do. Well, these are disciples. They're followers of Jesus. I believe these two probably saw Jesus do miracles. I believe they maybe saw him feed 5,000. I, I, I believe that. And I believe he, they saw him and followed him and his teaching. And somehow they missed the point of why Jesus was here. You know, I think that before we get too far along, we probably need to insert here that there are a lot of people, I believe, that misunderstand Jesus. As a matter of fact, I, I think that in our world today, there, is, there are very few that really understand who Jesus and, and, and his true identity. And I say that because all you have to do is look around the world, talk to somebody, ask them. And many, they, they honor, respect Jesus, believe he was a good man. Some curse and swear by his name, but for the most part, he's, he's just one of many. And as a matter of fact, when you think about religion today, and you think about America and where we are, I, when I grew up, what we always said, America is a Christian nation. I think we probably need to take that back, don't you? I don't think we are today. The evidence doesn't prove that today. You see, there's a, there's a push in this world today that everybody's religion ought to be accepted. Jesus is one, and most believe that all religions teach good things. They teach you how to be kind and considerate and all, all of these, and they put them in. When you accept all religions, what it becomes is pluralism, and that means that they're kind of all equal. There's nothing special about Christianity. It just teaches you how to be good and what, the way you ought to live. Well, as we look at this, we begin to find out that our religion is not like every other religion. Christianity is not at all like any of those. And, and we can't compare that to those. And these men are going to begin to see, and Jesus is going to reveal himself to them. And the way he does that, I think, is important for us to look at. Well, we see that he says, but we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And besides all this, today is the third day. When you think about what they said, their idea of what Jesus was going to do. You see, when you go back in Jewish history, you'll find that just look at the prophets that came around. Look at the day of the judges and look at David, the great warrior. And God sent people and that nation survived through that period of time, through the God and through those leaders and those people didn't understand God was in the background. God was responsible for their survival, not David and not Saul and not the judges, but it was God that preserved this nation. And they misunderstood the fact that somehow Jesus was going to come and he was going to free them from <clears throat> this Roman oppression. Let's go a little farther. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished which were early at the sepulcher, and when they found not his body, they came saying they, that they had seen a vision of angels which said that he was alive. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulcher. He's talking about Peter. Simon Peter went <clears throat> earlier in this chapter to the sepulcher and found it even so as the women had said, but him they saw not. Now, they had heard Jesus preach, they had heard him teach, but they didn't understand about the resurrection. They just knew that the body was not there. They, they had no explanation for that. It, maybe it was stolen, maybe it was taken away, they just don't know. But they still believe that Jesus is dead, and they believe that Jesus was, they haven't comprehended his mission in this world. Well, as we think about that for a minute, we might ask ourselves, who is Jesus to us? And what do you think he came to planet Earth for? What's his mission? What's it all about? We know the Old Testament, and we look at the Old Testament, and we need to understand this, folks, because if we miss this question, if we miss who Jesus is, his purpose, and it, how it relates to us, I'm going to tell you what, we're going to miss heaven. That's what we're going to miss. It is the most important question that we can ask ourselves. Well, look at how Jesus responds. Then 
He said unto them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Now, there are many people today that come and they say, we're a New Testament church. And we, we say that sometimes. But folks, the Bible is is a book, it's 66 books in one book, and the Old Testament, although it's different than the New Testament, it's still God's Word to us. And if we don't understand the Old Testament, I'm going to tell you, you will never understand the New Testament. You can't just take the New Testament and appreciate who Jesus Christ is until you read the Old Testament. Until you read Isaiah 800 years before Jesus came, drew a picture and described how Jesus was going to be taken to the slaughter, how he was as a lamb taken there, and he was going to be crucified. And when you look at that and you read that, and then you get to the New Testament... Well, you have a new appreciation for the Bible. And so what did Jesus do and what did he teach them about the Old Testament? You see, I, I think they had walked with Jesus. They had talked with Jesus. And in our world today, I believe a lot of people know about Jesus, but they don't have this understanding that they need to be saved. Well, let's talk about that a minute for, and just go through a few things, okay? Well, what, what do you think he talked about? I believe he talked about God as a creator. John in the gospel, he began with this. In the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and with God. And he goes on to say, everything that was made, he made. Folks, that's who Jesus is. Jesus is the word. We talk about this word, Jesus is the word. He was incarnate. John says he was brought into our world through flesh. He, he is God. And he's still human. He was born here and he walked on planet Earth and he create, created everything that was created. Something else we need to understand. We need to understand about the fall. What was the fall? The fall was when Adam and Eve were put in the garden and they were told everything here at your disposal except for one thing. Do not eat of the tree. And what did Satan do? He came right to the Eve and he said, and what did God say about that tree? And they sinned, and they, the one thing, only one prohibition that they had, they failed in that. That's a fall, folks. That is a fall. And just like Adam and Eve, we've all fallen. We, we inherited that from them, but don't mistake that you've fallen also, okay? You can't blame it all on them. We, we, we have our own sin problem, don't we? We were conceived in iniquity, the Bible says, but we, we all have sinned and gone our own way, the Bible tells us. We also need to know about redemption. What did God do when an Adam and Eve sinned? He taught a great lesson in Genesis. He said because of their sin, they're going to die, and we need to understand what death is. You see, death, when somebody dies, we look at them and we say they're, they're gone. Well, their flesh is gone, but their spirit is not. And when we think about this, we need to distinguish that. And some people say, well, what's your body and what's your soul? Well, I can tell you what, your, the best description is your body and your soul is everything that's not flesh. That's what it is. I mean, you see me today, but one day this, this body will be gone. And when it's gone, what's left over? And, and that goes to heaven to be with the Lord. And we need to understand that, that there is a separation of the body and the soul. And the Bible teaches us, he, a great lesson in the New Testament, he said, you know, you can gain the whole world, but don't lose your soul. The, it's more valuable than the whole world. And it's funny how we spend all our time getting things of the world and spend very little time protecting the one thing that God told us, don't lose your soul. Because if you lose your soul, you're going to spend eternity in hell. We need to understand about redemption. What is redemption? Well, when Adam and Eve sinned, God made an atonement for their sin. The very first sin, there was an atonement made. And what did God do? He took an animal, and he slew that animal and killed that animal, and he clothed them And because why? They felt naked. They felt sin for the first time. They felt guilt, and they felt shame. And God, God doesn't want to leave us in that position. He redeemed them that day, and he taught us about blood and about atonement. And when it says in here he went back to Moses, who instituted 
the, the system of sacrifices. Well, Moses did. And we think about that for a minute, and what, what, are, what is all that about? It was to teach us that sin has a penalty, and sin has a consequence. And the only thing that can atone for sin is blood. It, when, when he told Adam and Eve, the day you sin, you shall surely die, he was saying to them, you're not going to die physically today, but you will die. But the day you sin, you're going to be spiritually dead. And folks, we're dead. We're all, we were dead before we were saved. And what does being born again mean? It means that that spiritual part of us, we, God, God wants to save us. He wants to renew us. He wants to forgive us. And he, he comes to us, and when we're born again, we're not born physically, but we're born spiritually. You see, somebody said those who are born twice die once. Those who are born once die twice. And you begin to understand what the Scripture teaches us about that. If you don't experience a new birth, you're going to die, and that death is in hell. That is that separation from God, an eternal death, a death that has no end. What about atonement and substitution? Well, do, do I have to die for my sins? Am I going to die for my sins? Well, I am unless I make some preparation. And God, God came, and in the sacrificial system, he taught atonement, and he taught substitution. He taught that there is a way that you can be forgiven of those sins and you not die. And it all pointed to one thing. It pointed to Jesus Christ. It, and you look at that, and you look back, and you say, why couldn't they understand why Jesus came? All of those bulls and those goats and those pigeons and all those things that were sacrificed, they had no meaning except to point to Jesus Christ because Hebrews we said last week tells us there's only one one sacrifice for our sin and that's what Jesus did for us well Jesus was the Messiah he was the one who came he was the sacrifice and we talked about in Corinthians last week where God it pleased God to make Jesus sin for us he was our sin offering folks now if we don't understand that how can we be redeemed? If you don't understand how God has made a provision for your sin, how can you ever, ever gain, uh, how can you ever be forgiven? And so as we look at this, we begin to see Jesus, uh, he is trying to explain that. Let's go a little farther in this story. And they drew nigh into the village, whether they went, and he made as though he would have gone farther. But they constrained him, saying, abide with us, for it is towards evening, and the day is far spent, and he went in to tarry with them. He's going to spend the night with them, folks. And you begin to see these folks, are, these two men, are hungry for the truth. They don't understand it. They haven't come to a knowledge. They're, they're blind to it, but they want to know. And look at these last verses. And it came to pass, as he sat down at meat with them, he took bread, and he blessed it, and break, and it gave it to them. And their eyes were open, and they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. Well, we begin to see what Jesus did. Jesus revealed himself to them. Now, there's a word that's used in the Bible a whole lot, particularly in the New Testament, and that's mystery. Don't you like mystery? Sometimes you read a book, it's a mystery. And we kids love mysteries, you know. They love those hide and seek and finding and searching out and un uncovering the mystery. Well, God has given a mystery. I, I think about this, and that word is used. And what is it? It is something that has been veiled or covered up. And God's not trying to keep it from us, but we don't see it. And it's just like these two disciples. Jesus was there. They wanted to know. They didn't know. And God, through his spirit, he unveils that, and they are able to see, and they understand what he is. You see, that's what the Holy Spirit does in our life. We hear preaching, we hear teaching, and somebody witnesses us, but the Holy Spirit comes, and it gives us understanding. The Bible says that a natural man cannot understand the things of God. It's, it's foolishness to them. That's what it is. The Bible in Corinthians says the, the preaching is foolishness under the unbelieving world. They just think it's crazy. But yet for us, it's a mystery of God, how he sent Jesus. And I, I thought about this, and I want, I want to just relate it to me and you, okay? 
That's the mystery that these men did not understand. Now, you've got to think about that a minute. They walked with Jesus. They saw him. He taught. They had the Old Testament, but they missed it. And it was only this day that they finally understood who Jesus was. Now, I've got to ask you a question. If you think Jesus is a good man, did a lot of good things, is that enough to get you to heaven? If you believe that he's God's son, is that enough alone? We're getting warm, but I don't think we're there yet, do you? The Bible says about Satan, he knows who he is. What, what does it take? Well, it takes, we, we teach in, in a Baptist church that it comes to understanding our sin. Just like Adam and Eve, and just like others in the New Testament, Jesus explained it to Nicodemus this way, we've all sinned, we've all come short, and we're not going to see the glory of God. We have to be born again. And the Spirit convicts us, and it teaches us, and we begin to understand. I think the first part of that mystery we understand is who we are, our identity. We understand we're sinners, folks. The, the Holy Spirit convicts you that you're a sinner and that you need a, a relationship and you need forgiveness of your sin. And then it begins to teach us who Jesus is, and we, we, we begin to see that. It says here, their eyes were open. This mystery I'm talking about, let me, let me tell you, I believe that the church of the Lord Jesus Christ has been given this great big mystery. We have the answer to it, and the world out there needs to know, and nobody else is going to tell them if this church and if Christian people don't do it, and we don't help them to understand that mystery through the Holy Spirit, they're going to die, and they're going to be lost, and they're going to go to hell. That's what the Bible teaches us. And can I tell you, we're not doing a real good job of that, are we? We're not doing a real good job of that. It's not hard to figure out. When I said we're not a Christian nation anymore, well, Christian nation, they don't kill their unborn. They don't kill 60 million children since uh, the abortion law came in. Christians don't do that, do we? And, and we don't do the things that we, the things that you see in our world today, we don't do that. We don't make laws that hinder the family. We, uh, a Christian nation... When you look at the, what a Christian nation is and you look at us today, you have to confess and say somewhere along the line, we, we've lost that, haven't we? It, it's not that way anymore. I, folks, I wish it were. I wish it were, but it's not anymore. So you begin to see we have a real problem in our, in our world. And we have a real problem in America. I was thinking about this mystery. And when we were kids and I grew up, we'd raise money. Let's send missionaries to Africa. Let's send missionaries where people don't know the gospel. Can I tell you, you don't need a plane ticket. Just take a walk. Just take a walk. You don't need to go fly on a plane to witness. You just don't need to do that. If you were to have a community backyard Bible school. Can I tell you, I bet you 90% of the children that would come if you invited them would be lost, and they would have no idea about who Jesus is. You, that's what they do when they send missionaries out. That's what we did when people went to Guatemala and we were trying to reach them. You, 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 you do that. Can I tell you, the people and the children of America are as ignorant about these things as any other part of the world, maybe more so, and we've diluted it down to where we say, you know, well, earlier I said it's like pluralism. Well, yeah, Jesus is okay, and Allah's okay, and this one's okay, and they'll all help you be a better person, and that's the way we have it today. I, I, it's, it's troubling, folks. And i tell you one other thing I heard this week, and I read, and it's just, do you, do you know that Christians are the most persecuted group in America? You know how many Christians were killed this past year, were persecuted to death in our world? 100,000 Christians were persecuted. Three quarters of the countries of the world have laws that are discriminatory towards Christians. And by the way, you can add America to that list. You can add America to that list. That's where we are. We have laws, and we're creating laws, and we're making laws that make it impossible for you to be obedient to the state and still be true to your Christian faith over and over and over. You see it in our world. And we begin to see this mystery. I, I saw something this past week that I had never seen. How many of you know what a life straw is? Have you ever seen a life straw? 
Well, let me tell you why life straw was created. They tell us that two to three million children in the world die each year because they drink unsanitary water, water that has bacteria in it, water that has all kinds of problems. We talk about clean water, and we all want to drink clean water, and, and for the most part, we, we're okay in America, but we have some problems, don't we? Every once in a while, like Flint, Michigan, you begin to see that, how it comes out. But throughout the world, people die from drinking bad water. And a life straw is about this long, about as big as a cigar, maybe a little bit bigger. And if you camp or trail or whatever, you can stick it down in unclean water. You remember the old westerns, they'd say, don't you drink that water. You drink that water, we, we, we've been waiting for water, but don't you drink that water because it'll key you if you do. You stick the straw down in the water and you suck through the straw and it's a purification system that comes up and you're able to drink the water and survive. That's what a life straw is. Pretty neat thing, isn't it? I like the thought of that. Can I tell you what the church is? The church is life straw of America. And if the church does not do his job and if the church doesn't un unveil that mystery about Jesus Christ, folks, this, the job's just not going to get done. And, and we're losing. We're losing. We've tried all kinds of things. You know, I think one of the greatest witnesses is your own testimony. Your own testimony of how God changed you. And, and, and most of the time, it's effective with your friends. It's effective with your children. It's effective with people that you know. And it's especially effective when you go out and you see people that are hurting, people at work that are struggling, going through a divorce, going through death, going through all kinds of things, and you get a chance to speak to them. Folks, that is the time to introduce. It's, it's not hard, is it? It's not hard, but we have gotten so tight-lipped and so afraid and the government you know what they say don't you speak about that in school so that's eight hours a day the children can't do it and don't you speak about it in a in a public setting don't you speak about it here and and we begin to look and say how in the world are we ever going to get out of this mess we're in folks it's the curve is just like this we're headed down we're headed down christianity is headed down you just need to look, and I, I'm not a pessimist, but it shows us what we need to be doing. That's what it shows us, folks. Why don't people come to Christ? People don't come to Christ because they don't know who Christ is. If they knew what you knew about Christ, I think most of them would say yes, wouldn't they? If they knew what you know about Christ, if they knew how you felt once you were forgiven of your sins, once that you can lay down at night and you don't have to worry or dread if you don't wake up the next morning where you're going to be. To be able to look at your friends and your family when you lose one of them and you have the sense of security and knowledge that they're with the Lord Jesus Christ. Folks, those are the things that are important. They're the things that are important. That's part of that mystery God has given to us. I see how Jesus revealed to them. He did it through the scripture, didn't he? He took, he took the Bible and he went back and he explained. And I wonder sometimes, you know, we preach and God just kind of convicted me a few months ago, weeks ago. Jack, you, you teach all this stuff, but if you don't make people understand, it ain't no good, is it? It's just not any good. Somehow our children and our, we, we just, I don't know if we talk over their head. I don't know if we just don't get to the simple things, but we got to learn to communicate better, haven't we, folks? we got to learn how to communicate, and we need to start with those that are close by. I brought two boys to church today, and I thought about them when I was coming, and I thought, boy, some, I, I hope I live long enough. I hope somebody, when they're old enough, shares with them. I hope it's a teacher. I hope it's somebody here. I hope somebody unveils Jesus Christ and it clicks one day, and they say, I know who he is, and I think I want him. I think I want him to be a part of my life. Well, that's our lesson today. Let's bow for our prayer. Lord, we just thank you today for helping us one day to understand that mystery of who you are and to understand your true identity. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us to celebrate that new life that we have, but to understand that after we're saved that we're commissioned. And, and you give us commission to, and, and we'll study it in the next lesson, probably to go into all the world and preach and teach in whatever way you can, whatever method you can, 
but we have a responsibility to share Jesus. Lord, I pray, pray that you'll just help us to see what our problem is. Our problem in America is a spiritual problem. It's not a political problem. It's not an economic problem. It's a matter of priorities. And it's a matter of what we want to focus our life on. And I just pray you'll help us to just examine our life and see how we can do better, we might do better, how we might influence those that are around us. And, and Lord, as you give us opportunities, I pray you'll help us to be faithful in our witness. We ask it in the name of our Savior that saved us and redeemed us, the Lord Jesus Christ.